The Chigusa Corporation suffered record losses after the loss of a year's worth of harvest and the destruction of the Prosperity Wells colony on the planet of Ryushi. Pilots of the cargo vessel the Lecter, Strandberg and Conover, and the former colony overseer Hiroki, along with several other colonists, were killed. Thanks to the quick thinking and bravery of the newly appointed overseer, Machiko Naguchi, many lives were saved. The surviving colonists were reinstated to different roles on frontier installations. Miss Naguchi, however, opted to stay on Ryushi, for reasons unclear. Two years after the event, the USCM responded to a distress signal sent from the planet. A platoon of marines set down on Ryushi. Upon their initial investigation, Naguchi was nowhere to be found. Captain Glass led the investigation and witnessed the entirety of the horror that unfolded. It all comes down to choices. Make the right choice just one time and you've got it easy the rest of your life. But choose the wrong and you pay for it. My squad had been paying for it since we touched down on Ryushi. Every Marine across the galaxy knew what to look for. After the Acheron fiasco and a couple of other incidents, Core forced Wayland yutani to cough up what they knew about the bugs. The company didn't like it much, but they wanted marine protection for their colonies. The computer reconstructions they supplied were extremely detailed, and looked nothing at all like what we found. The giant ship, partially buried inside of a mountain, was unlike anything they'd seen. Not from the company files, certainly not man-made, but most likely the source of the distress signal. This was extraterrestrial technology. The Corps had a playbook for XD encounters. Such technology could be invaluable beyond research and development's wildest dreams. And if any XD passengers survived inside, they needed to be kept alive. The Marines found an opening in the massive craft. At least now they wouldn't have to worry about walking up and knocking. Let's proceed with caution, Sergeant, said Glass. All right, ladies, you heard the captain. By the book. Pair up. Safety's off fingers on the trigger. Lieutenant Sally paused and looked up into the mountains, trying to shake an indescribable feeling that they were being watched. Those cliffs would make a good spot from which to mount an ambush, eh, Sergeant? Suppose so, Lieutenant, Sergeant Lesser agreed. But if I was going to lay in wait, I'd do it from inside the ship. Only room for one man at a time to enter through that rent. Plus, you'd be out of this heat. Good point. It's hard to say where we made our first bad decision. Maybe it was deciding to enter the derelict ship. Or was it in choosing to come to Ryushi at all? Reed was the first to step foot inside. His displeasure at drawing point was obvious, but he did not hesitate. Lesser and Sally were right behind and stalled upon entering, as they and Reed saw movement somewhere in the shadows of the unlit ship. Reed shouted, clearly spooked, pointing out the direction of the movement. Right there! Right there! The creature jumped out into the light still peeking in from the ship's opening, howling a death cry and preparing to lunge at the intruders. Was this what they read about in the files? Lessie didn't waste any time. Bug! He yelled out, as he fired rounds into the snarling animal. The others quickly joined him, the firing of their pulse rifles illuminating the deep chasms of the alien ship. All but Sergeant Lesser. He was less concerned over the snarling beast and more over the ammo being wasted. He shouted loud enough for the rest to hear over the firing. Cease fire! Stop shooting, you idiots! After the firing stopped, the Marines looked toward Lesser, whose face was glowing in a blue light emitted from the screen of an information readout, his eyes calmly scanning the data before him. Bowen approached, offering a mild protest. But there were bugs, sir! If there were bugs, Bowen, you'd most likely be dead by now, the way you were shooting. The only thing in there was that. He gestured toward the dead animal and the readout. Says here it's a briar wolf. Indigenous. Glass stepped in, not allowing a moment's relief at this revelation. Yeah, well, this tub sure isn't native to this rock, Lesser. Take a couple men and check out that tunnel. Sally, you take the other one. Lesser addressed his men. You heard the captain. Reed, you stay with me. They moved out. Lesser and Reed cautiously made their way through the dark, narrowing tunnel of the XT craft. Before them, apparently the ship's hull had collapsed, leaving a victim beneath. Long dead, the skeletal remains captured the final dying moments of one of the ship's inhabitants. It must have been there a long time. Or maybe it had been picked clean. 
The sprawled skeleton was large, but looked almost human-like. Reed noted as such. They peered in for a closer look. Lesser directed his shoulder light at the thing's skull. Look again, kid, he said. These guys would give Ugly a bad name. At least we know what the Briar Wolf was eating. But that thing looked half-starved. Why didn't it leave the ship to find more food? Before Lesser could contemplate this notion, a call from further down echoed through the hall. Hey, we found something. Lesser and Reed quickly joined the others, telling them of their discovery. We found a non-survivor. Hull caved in and crushed him. Corridor dead ends. He approached Glass. What do you have here? A live one, I think. At least, for now. His... Uh... Her... Its breathing is very ragged, but there are no broken bones I can find. Ugly son of a bitch. But I guess that won't matter to the boys at XTR. A couple of you build a litter. Let's get this guy to transport. Yes, sir. Lesser looked down, observing this being compared to his friend back at the hull. They look worse with their skin on. Say, Sarge, why do you suppose the Briar Wolf didn't eat this one? Reed asked. Well, I... Captain, come quick. You won't believe this. Now what? Glass asked to no one in particular. The call came from Private Carlston. Glass came to see the new discovery, and could barely contain his shock when he saw it. Look what I found, Captain! The Private bellowed, enthusiastically, not sharing Glass's dread. What? Carlston, get away from that thing! This was unlike the other body found inside the doomed craft, a different species entirely. It towered above the two men, with chains securing it to the wall. One arm was free, sprawled across the floor in an apparent attempt to escape, or perhaps a result of the less-than-smooth landing. Was this... thing a prisoner? This had to be one of the bugs. It's all right, Captain Glass, said Carlston assuringly. She's dead. Whoever owns this ship must be the toughest hombres in the galaxy. Imagine keeping one of these tied up, like a pet. Glass kept his weapon aimed at the creature's slumped head, making sure not to get too close. Not as close as Carlston, anyway. That doesn't look like a pet, and I'm the toughest hombre you're ever gonna meet, and don't you forget it. Now stop clowning around. I don't want anybody near that thing until Lieutenant Sally has a look at it. Aw, oh, Captain, you worry like my mama. He let out a slight laugh. In a swift movement far too fast for Carlston to react to, the beast's free hand grabbed at his legs, pulling him upside down and thrashing him like a rag doll. The thing hissed at its prey. The sound made the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. Oh God, help me! Somebody help me! Carlston screamed. Glass and the others who followed to see his discovery were frozen at the sight, just for a moment. But that was all the captive bug needed to land its final deadly blow. Carlston begged. No, please as he could see what was about to happen to him, and with a loud crunch and a spray of warm blood, the begging stopped. Fire! Kill it! Glass commanded, composure regained, and they all let out a hail of fire that tore holes through the bug's skull and body as blood poured and burned through the flooring of the ship so quickly that an eerie mist began to surround it, and the shooters gave way to retreat. Sally and Lesser were collecting the nearly dead inhabitant when they heard the gunfire, and soon came Glass's commands to pull out. What's going on? Sally asked. It's a bug. A big one. Get our survivor back to the ATV. We've seen enough. We're sure not equipped to handle any more. Sally and Lesser, each grabbing ends of the survivor and moving as quickly as they could, lifted it and began their retreat with the others. If there are bugs down this tunnel, that could explain why the wolf didn't eat this guy, Lesser noted. Yeah, maybe, said Sally but it doesn't explain why the bugs didn't eat him. Come on now. Lift. Bowen reached the exit first. He called to the others, still not ready to exit. Keep moving, Kagletti. Get to the ATV. There are bugs back there. She responded. No. Wait for the others to form up. Glass, right behind Kogletti, shouted at the panicked Marine. Damn it, Bowen. Hold your position. He was already outside of the ship. He was panting making a run for the ATV, and not noticing the rumbling from the ground beneath him. No, sir. Gotta get to the ATV. And the big guns. 
I ain't gonna go toe-to-toe -to -toe with no... Bugs! He finished, as the alien leapt at him with blinding speed. Another bug soon followed. A horde had been waiting beneath the surface, and had now revealed themselves after hearing the cries of their queen. It was an ambush. More of them, Reed called, as he steadied his pulse rifle and aimed. This explains why the Briarwolf stayed inside the ship. You can get in, but you can't get out. Glass steadied his weapon as well, making sure the armed marines held a steady perimeter around the two holding their guest. Yeah, well, the wolf wasn't armed with a pulse rifle. We move slowly, and we stay together. Shoot anything that moves. We're leaving, and the bugs aren't going to stop us. Go! He shouted, firing off into the approaching bugs, piercing through the chest of one, removing the head of another. Still more came, with no signs of slowing down. They made their way to the ATV as quickly as they could, but Lesser and Sally were beginning to lag significantly due to the XD's weight. More bugs came. They were no doubt outnumbered, and pretty close to completely fucked. As one of the bugs approached Glass, the flash of a blue light momentarily blinded him. A beam of energy from a source he could not see burned through the alien, taking it to pieces in a clean break. What the? Where'd that come from? Glass looked around. He saw a faint outline, a shimmering from above, jumping down into the area. More bugs! Reed screamed, aiming his gun. No, hold your fire. They're survivors from the ship. Another bad decision. I should have let the squad cut them down. But those weren't our orders. We were there to help. We were on a mission of mercy. If we'd wandered into the middle of some grudge fight, I wanted no part of it, and it didn't look like our assistance was required. Armed with a long spear clad in blue metallic armor of some kind, the XT tore through the bugs with ease, a trained warrior. As if this thing had more than its fair share of experience, lacking a right hand, maybe that was a good bet. As the battle eased down, it turned its attention to the other beings in the midst of Ryushi's desert, now at the ATV. Private France caught the creature's gaze from several feet away, and he warned the others. Uh, Captain, it's looking our way. Stand tight, France, Captain Glass ordered. Don't do anything stupid. Maybe they just want to talk, France said. Let's hope said Cogletti, as she stepped out of the vehicle and made an approach to the monster, appearing as diplomatic as possible. Steady, Cogletti, whispered Lesser. As a rock, sir, she whispered back. Don't make any threatening moves. Let's remember the reason we're here. She addressed the visitor, clamoring to put a sentence together, trying not to display any fear. Uh, thanks for the help. We received your signal. We came to help you. We mean you no harm. The hunter stared at the marine for a moment, then plunged its spear into her chest. It made a quick bloodied motion as Glass stood by in horror. The weapon was pulled out as quickly as it went in, with the ease of a hot knife through butter. The XT raised its weapon in triumph, as blood dripped down from the pointed end. Glass let out a scream. If it wasn't clear before, it sure was now. This mission had gone completely to hell. We received a distress signal. We came to help. A first meeting between mankind and intelligent XTs. And we expected... What? Gratitude, maybe? But they're as much monsters as the alien bugs they brought with them. More of the XTs came running toward the ATV to join their one-handed brother. The Marines aimed their pulse rifles. Lessie called out. Captain Glass, it killed Cogletti. Get him, Magessi. Blow the sucker away. From Reed. The ATV began to spring to life as Glass hopped aboard. The Marines fired at the assailant, but missing their target as it faded into a desert mirage. He's disappearing, Lesser called out, helping Glass get aboard. It's no good, sir. They vanished. No, they're still there, Lesser. We just can't see them. A loud, metallic thud met with the ATV as something had jumped atop the vehicle. Glass could barely make out what it was, but he could see an outline, something in the shape of the XTs. A camouflage of some kind. 
Look out, he shouted, raising his weapon and firing at the shimmering outline. Glowing green blood spewed from holes forming in the once invisible force, and it appeared clear as day before him as it blew back off the ATV and onto the hot desert ground. The thing was now dead. Invisible, but not invulnerable. That may be important later. What's important right now is getting out of here. The ATV swerved, knocking away any bugs in its way, and almost hitting another shimmering outline which leapt out of the way before becoming roadkill. It stood and stared at the vehicle as the ATV sped away, further into the distance. His prey had escaped. For now. The hunt was far from over. This was the one they called Lightstepper. This was his hunt. A blooded warrior, his word was law, and he was not about to make the same mistakes that hindered him in past hunts. His own blooding, years ago. In a hunt lasting two planet days, the young hunter, with nine others, were chosen to stalk the most dangerous prey the tribe worlds have ever encountered. The Conde at Mita. Hard meat. Two Stripes, another young blood, had suspected their guide, old Topknot, had lost the trail. Lightstepper proved him wrong. The hard meat were near. The discovery of the first sign would bring much honor. An honor Two Stripes had decided to claim for himself. This caused a conflict between the two young bloods. Lightstepper's honor was at stake. Topknot broke up the fight. The leader, a veteran of many hunts, his word was law. The young bloods continued with their hunt, and it was Lightstepper who found the first, hiding in the water. It emerged tail first, unmasking the hunter. Lightstepper quickly gained his ground. He raised his weapon, snarling fearlessly at the hard meat, and leapt toward it. A swing of the spear, too slow. The swing of the hard meat's tail breaking his weapon in half. Lightstepper dropped the useless spear and bore the blades on his wrist, making a lunge to the creature. Its force was powerful, bringing him into the water, its second set of gleaming jaws snapping directly into Lightstepper's face. It tore off one of his lower mandibles. The pain was excruciating, but Lightstepper was not here to die. He took one more forceful notion of his blade slicing right across the neck of the hard meat. It screamed a dying cry and its blood gushed from the wound. The burning thway spilled onto Lightstepper, boiling over his right hand, dissolving into nothing. All as two stripes watched from above. He peered over his fellow hunter, next to the dead hard meat. He assessed that soon, too, Lightstepper would be dead, if he wasn't already. He took the head of the creature as well as a hand, carefully placing markings with the claws and burning thway to give the impression of a plausible duel. A successful hunt would raise Two Stripes standing in the tribe more than twenty lesser trophies. He returned to them beaming with pride, holding up his trophy. He would expect to become blooded this day. What he didn't expect was to see Lightstepper, still alive and retrieved by the others. He had told the story of his fight. Topknot knew the truth of Two Stripes' trophy, his dishonor, his failure. Failure on this hunt almost always means death, but he was given a chance to prove his worth. No armor, no weapons, just him and the Conde Admita. Lightstepper had learned so much since that day about the importance of honor and setting an example should it be tainted. He learned of the unpredictability of the hunt, and had always heard the stories of the soft meat, the Umans. Before now, he had never seen one up close, but he knew of how dangerous and how cunning they were, and he knew how the right Uman could make an honorable trophy. Lightstepper sensed his was not far off. The Marines sped through the desert in the ATV, still confused and shocked about their XD encounter, and waiting to make the next move. What was that all about, sir? asked Lesser. Hell if I know, Sergeant, Glass said. But we're not waiting around for an explanation. We'll head back to the Noguchi woman's cabin, use her antenna array to boost a signal past Signy Miner's interference. We're calling Murphy for a dust-off. They moved in to set up at the cabin. Sally brought down the XT. How's our, uh, survivor, Sally? 
How can I know, Glass? His body temperature's much higher than ours, his breathing's ragged, and he stinks. But for all I know, that might be normal for him. Given the trouble we've already had, I vote we forget about him and just get ourselves off this dust ball. Come on, Sally, you know we can't do that. The brass at R&D would have our butts. This is an important discovery. See if we can't keep him alive, at least until we can get him into hypersleep. Captain, we've got an uplink. Good. Tell Murphy we want her here yesterday. Done, sir. She says ETA 20 minutes. She's cooking on all burners. All right, pack up. Let's hit the LZ. Keep your eyes open. This is no time to get sloppy. Sir, you think Murphy will get here before this guy's buddies do? What are you talking about, France? Why would they follow us? Besides, we put ten clicks between us and that ship. The kid's got a point, sir. We stuck our noses in the middle of something we don't understand, that's for sure. Trying to guess what the XTs will or won't do is a sucker's bet. And you saw how fast they were. No telling how quickly they can cover open ground. And don't forget, we'd never see them coming. Maybe. I still think you're worrying about nothing. Come on, let's get this guy on board. They lifted the half-dead creature and began to move it toward the ATV. Suddenly, a groan of pain howled out. It began writhing, and Reed lost his grip. Hey, what's wrong with this? The XT growled louder, now convulsing wildly, knocking the men back. Glass realized another unpleasant surprise was about to reveal itself. Oh no. What is it, sir? What's happened? The XT's chest ripped open. Its howls now fell silent as it fell dead and outward emerged a screeching parasite, bearing pointed fangs and mandibles, quickly scattering from its host body. Bug! Glass shouted. Get it! Lesser screamed, reaching for his weapon. The parasite hissed and looked directly at him. Don't let it get away! He fired as this small and possibly quick monster scurried, leaving a trail of blood and slime from where it emerged. Come on, France, move it! Get around on the other side of the ATV. We gotta kill that thing before it... The white light of the XT's weaponry blared from the distance. In a quick flash, it tore through Lesser, from the middle of his chest, across his left arm. Glass reached out and called to the sergeant, who was dead before he hit the ground. Where'd that shot come from? Glass demanded, looking around wildly. No telling, said Sally. Lesser was right. We never saw them coming. I told you! Reed said. He lifted his pulse rifle and began firing. What is it? What are we shooting at? The XTs from the ship. The ones who killed Kogleti. They're out there somewhere. They killed Sarge. Lay down crisscrossing lines of fire, commanded Glass. Pour it on. They shot wildly into the desert horizon, hoping to hit something, hoping to catch a glimpse of a shimmering outline and pump green holes into them, as they had done previously. This is crazy. We've got to get out of here, from Sally. You're telling me, Glass agreed. Get them into the ATV. I'll... He heard a loud rumbling. What's that? It's Murphy. The ship is coming. They ran to the ATV. Glass hopped into the driver's seat, grabbing at the radio. He called the others. Get in the vehicle. The ship is coming. He picked up the headset and urgently warned the incoming pilot. Murphy, this is Glass. Do you read me? LZ is not secure. Repeat, LZ is not secure. Do you copy? Murphy, do you... Oh my god. He saw now the XTs were no longer camouflaged. Their leader, the one with one hand, held up a device. Some kind of shoulder-fired RPG. It was big. Big enough to take down... Oh no. He realized what was about to happen. The weapon fired. No! Glass screamed out, looking outside the ATV as he saw the projectile hurtling toward the ship. It met its target. The sky burned with fire, and the ship completely incinerated. There was no going home now. Glass, we've got to get out of here from Sally. You're telling me? Get back there and lay down some covering fire. Glass sped up the ATV and Reed took gunning control, 
He fired at the XTs who had left them stranded, now cloaked again, leaving him only to chase outlines. The whole mission had gone to hell, and now our ride back was gone. Twice I had let the XTs take us by surprise, to control the battle. No more. From now on, we were going to fight the battle on our terms. We were going to show these guys what happens when you mess with the Marines. Reed had spotted one, and once one bullet hole illuminated the glowing green blood of the alien bastard, it wasn't hard to make a target out of it. He continued his firing, and finally, one more of the XT murderers was down. Reed sighed with relief, and a newly found confidence. We got one, Captain. Let's stay and fight. We can take them. I understood Reed's feelings. The monsters had killed our friends, possibly killed us by stranding us here. I understood the need for revenge, but I also knew the importance of keeping a clear head. We had to find a place to make a stand, and to make the monsters come to us. Prosperity Wells. Once it was a colony, now it was a junkyard. If anyone knew what happened to it, they hadn't put the information in our computer. But whatever had caused its destruction, we felt better for having it at our backs. It meant the monsters could come at us from only one direction. I want a wall, shoulder high, here. We'll put the motion detector 50 yards out. The row of mines goes right behind it. By the end of the long Ryushi day, we were ready for them. Glass stood, watching out into the distance, waiting anticipating the next move. Sally approached. Maybe we should let a couple of troops catch some Zs. They're looking pretty ragged. Okay, Sally. McGessy and France first, then you and Reed. What about you? I can't sleep. Not after what happened. All I can think about is making them pay. I want to be here to detonate the charges when the motion detector goes off. I don't want any more surprises. A loud hissing caused Glass, Sally, and the others to turn and look upon the giant creature moving in on them. The hideous beast shot out its bladed tail, ripping through Sally's throat, opening his jugular, allowing a fountain of blood to erupt as he fell, taking precious few wet gasps before darkness fell upon him. Simultaneously, the creature had grabbed Reed by the head, clasping it entirely with one clawed hand, then closing it crushing Reed's skull. The creature was a nightmare hybrid of a bug and XTs from the crash site. Maybe that was why the XTs were after us. We allowed this monster to be born. We'd let it out into the world. Maybe it was something they had encountered before, something capable of taking down their entire species, killing them as easily and indiscriminately as it's been killing us humans. Maybe it was against their religion. An abomination. I knew we couldn't allow it to live. McGessy shot wildly at the creature as it turned back. France ducked out of the line of fire, covering his ears as McGessy continued to let out rounds, screaming. It killed Reed! Get it! If any of the bullets did hit the giant, they didn't seem to have much effect. It ran outside the barricade and only heightened McGessy's fury. Come back here, you... The tracker suddenly went to a frenzy. A steadily increasing series of beeps indicated that the XTs were close by, and coming in fast. McGessy! Get down! Glass yelled. The warning was too late, and McGessy was shot with the hunter's weapon. They were here. They couldn't see them, even less so in the dark of night, but they had come to finish the hunt. Glass reached for the detonator. He looked out, still no sign of any shimmering outlines. I can't see you monsters, but I know you're there. He set off the charges. The black of night lit up in fiery vengeance. The shadows of bodies being knocked back, some blown apart, could be seen. The plan had worked. He'd sent the fuckers straight to hell. Only Glass and France remained. Come on, kid. We can't stay here, Glass told the young, shaken Marine. But... where? away. Smoke encompassed the dark desert plains. Bodies of the hunters were strewn about, save for one. Lightstepper, coughing up blood, which seeped through his mask, pushed against the ground to get himself to his feet. 
He stood, steadying himself, and clasped at his biomask. He pulled it off and surveyed the damage. All were dead. No one left to lead in this hunt. The Umans were as dangerous and crafty as he had been warned. Still regaining composure, Lightstepper slowly walked to the marine barricade. No living prey to be found. He looked over the dead body of one of the Umans. He inspected the wounds. This was not from any of his tribe's weaponry. This did not seem to be the doings of just any Conde Admita either. Based on the wounds, this was something bigger. It was true, then, that the fallen Yaucha had been compromised, infected with impurity. The abomination could not be allowed to live. Lightstepper vowed if this were to be his final hunt, then he would kill it, at all costs. It was then that he heard gunshots. The Umans and the Abomination were close. Glass and France stopped to catch their breath. They were tired, scared, and panting as they looked around to see if the beast was still in pursuit. I don't hear it, Captain, France said. He took a deep breath. Maybe we should stop and make a stand. Still looking from all directions, Glass called back, panting. How many rounds you have left, France? Three, he continued gasping for air. Glass checked his own. He was out. McGessie had let out a lot more than three rounds onto the giant monster and that didn't seem to help much. Making a stand here wouldn't be an option. Keep running, he called, picking up the pace as much as he could. France followed, still gasping in the dry Ryushi night air. We gotta find our way back to the ATV. We put some clicks between us and... Before he could finish the thought, Glass's boot caught a jagged rock. It sent him tumbling to the ground. France stopped. Sir! Are you alright, sir? Glass brought himself up. Fine. I just tripped... The rumble of steps in the sand echoed nearby, scuffing slowly and getting closer. What was that? It came from over there. France aimed toward the direction of the noise. He began firing. Shots went out without a clear view of what was advancing upon them. No! Glass shouted. Don't shoot! France disobeyed. Gunshots blazed loudly still, until nothing but smoke remained, and the faint clicking of his empty weapon. From out of the smoke, the figure began to emerge. France's finger was still on the trigger. It still clicked uselessly, as if he hadn't even noticed. The poor young man must have lost it now. It advanced, staring France face to face. It opened its jaws and began tearing into him. He let out muffled calls for help, but Glass knew he was far beyond that at this point. He continued to run. He stopped at the sight of another figure before him. It breathed heavily, raising its metallic claws which glimmered in the moonlight. It let out a fierce roar, a battle cry, but looked beyond Glass and toward the other figure, now behind him. He was between two monstrous giants, in the middle of a war between honor and atrocity. It didn't seem like this was his fight any longer. Glass ducked out of the way as Lightstepper jumped at a speed and distance impossible for any human, baring his teeth and disfigured mandibles, directing his blades at his target. Both beasts growled hideously, and all Glass could do was watch, mouth agape at the sight. The two monsters struggled, and Glass's instinct told him to go back to France and pick up his weapon. The abomination was now on top of Lightstepper. It looked like he may be losing. This didn't sit right with Glass. He wanted the bastard creature dead almost as much as the hunter did. He had no bullets, but maybe he could buy some time. With all of his strength, Glass swung down on the monster, using the rifle as a club. It barely flinched, barely seemed affected at all, but it did buy some time, and he had its attention narrowly avoiding the deadly swipe of its tail as it turned around him and hissed. This was enough of a distraction for Lightstepper, who had a clear shot at it now, and tore at its neck with his wrist blade. He had learned all too well to quickly move his arm away after this motion. He stepped back slightly as he rose to his feet. Glass took another swipe with his weapon right across its head. This time, it screeched in pain. The monster took another jab at it, this time in the chest. More screeching. It turned, anticipating another blow from the club, and this time Lightstepper thrust the blades into its back with all the force he had left. One final blood-curdling screech of pain, and then no more. It fell to the ground. 
it was dead. Both human and hunter let out their sighs of exhaustion and looked over to be absolutely positive. Like I said, it comes down to choices. Good or bad, life or death, sane or crazy. Sometimes you don't know why you make certain decisions. But sometimes crazy choices are the right ones, at least in the short run. Together we'd taken out an enemy that would have killed us both, and maybe at that moment we came to some kind of understanding. Or maybe we were just too tired to fight each other anymore. Either way, there's nothing to do now but wait, and see whose people show up first. While Michiko Noguchi was nowhere to be found, there was unfinished business on the planet of Ryushi. This was explored in the follow-up story to the original Alien vs. Predator comic, Duel. It was written by Randy Stradley, with art by Javier Sarteris, Jimmy Pamiotti, and Jim Sinclair. This landmark and influential comic was notable not just for continuing the tradition of Dark Horse's crossover, but for being the very first story to include the Predalien hybrid, a creature explored much further in Alien and Predator media to follow. For more on the Ryushi conflict and the trials of Machiko Noguchi, please see the playlist on the end screen and the description below. As always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching today. I really appreciate it, and if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a like and you can also subscribe for all the latest videos from the channel. A very, very special thanks goes out to Whaling Jutani Executives, Emiric, Mark Fox, and in the Ellen Ripley Tier of Excellence, Lady Anne. My thanks also goes out to the Hive Queens, Ronnie Jensen, Alisane, and Jackson Roche, all part of the Patreon Hive. If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for exclusive posts and contests. In the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media, Follow at Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.